Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 52, What I Learned at the FinCon 2016 Financial Conference. Today's episode is going to be a recap of what I learned at the conference, where I attended and spoke on what is Bitcoin and why should you care in San Diego, California. I just had to share with you what I learned, the insights I got, and what people thought about Bitcoin and the type of questions that they asked and what I felt like really hit home with them. So hang in there. One more episode on FinCon. It was a wonderful experience. I met tons of interesting people and I helped bring the ideas and understanding of Bitcoin to the mainstream. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, and thanks again for tuning in. I am back from the FinCon conference in San Diego, California, and I've got a lot to share. I'm gonna be going over how my presentation was received a lot of other things that I noticed at the conference. It was a fairly large conference. I would say 12, 1300 people or so. Remember, they're young, finance-oriented bloggers, podcasters, writers, authors, people trying to spread a message about what it means to take care of yourself financially. So let's get into the Bitcoin aspect first. Uh, as everyone here that listens to the show knows, I spoke on Bitcoin and the title of my presentation was what is Bitcoin and why should you care? Remember, this is not a technical audience. These are not computer programmers or engineers. So I really wanted to tailor the presentation to my audience. So beforehand, I went around asking everyone that I could find, hey, have you heard of Bitcoin? Just have you heard of Bitcoin? I'm Ash. Have you heard of Bitcoin? I'm presenting on it tomorrow. And every single person I spoke with had heard of Bitcoin. This is a, a lot different than just a couple of years ago when you would go to conferences or, or you would just meet people in everyday life and almost nobody had heard of Bitcoin. So I, I took that as a very positive aspect of where Bitcoin is headed is that everyone has heard about it. Nobody knew what it was though. So not a lot of change there. Some people had heard that Bitcoin got hacked or you can buy drugs with Bitcoin. The, the mainstream or what I've been calling the establishment media's narrative on Bitcoin was definitely still alive and well. That didn't deter me, though. I, I expected that coming in. And so uh, I wanted to help people understand not only the usefulness of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but also the, the voluntary nature of it. So one thing that really hit home early in my presentation was I started out with the quote in the Genesis block that says, uh, Chancellor on brink of second round of bailouts for big banks. So I basically said, Janu let me take you back in time. January the 3rd, 2009, the big banks are about to get bailed out again the second time with your money, with the taxpayer's money. Not only did we put our money in these banks with trust that they were going to hold it for us and maybe even pay us interest on it. And it was going to be a good value for us. And then they lost it. But now they're getting more of our money because they lost our money. And I felt like this was a really good way to try to connect with this financial crowd very early because a lot of people from when I was going around and asking beforehand didn't like the type of bank bailouts or just corporate bailouts in general. So I really used that to hit home with them and it, it worked very well. Another thing that I found to work well and I got good feedback on was calling Bitcoin an opt-in, opt-out monetary system. Basically, if you find value in Bitcoin, then use it. And I said, I don't know how you're going to find value. Maybe it's in your professional life. Maybe Bitcoin's easier or faster or cheaper for you to use to build your business, especially a digital business. Or you appreciate what Bitcoin stands for, the low barrier to entry, the equality of money. 
you know, the, the financial inclusion. If you find any way that Bitcoin supports what you're doing, then use it and see what you can do with it in your own personal life. If you think it's a scam or you think it's shady or only drug dealers or criminals use it, then don't use it. Nobody's going to point a gun to your head. Nobody's going to force you into this system. And I made sure to say, unlike the currency systems that we're currently in, the monetary systems of the dollar or of the euro, where we have no voluntary nature, we have no ability to opt out of these monetary systems, and we're stuck holding the bill for these types of bank bailouts that you don't agree with. And that worked really, really well. You know, what I'm trying to do in this podcast is to help some of you have a different perspective whenever we're going and talking to people who I'm calling mainstream people, people that don't have their nose in Bitcoin every day like I do and like a lot of my listeners do. Not only do we have to convince each other of, you know, why we should integrate Bitcoin in different aspects of society and our economy, or not even Bitcoin, but different types of cryptocurrencies. But we need to appeal to all sorts of people, all different types of people. And we know that Bitcoin has the, that appeal, but it's up to us to be able to communicate that appeal to people and helping them understand it's an opt-in, opt-out, voluntary, monetary system was a really big win for me. Another big win in the presentation was when I said that Bitcoin was a peer-to-peer system. I used a, a prop with someone in the audience and I said, you know, if I wanted to buy that sweater from you and you wanted to sell that sweater to me, why is it anyone else's business about what we do? I want to do business with you. You want to do business with me. Let's opt in. Let's do it. Both of us think it's a valuable transaction and that we're coming out the other side better. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. Why is it anyone else's business? Why should somebody apply fees to that middle side? Why should somebody poke their nose in there and tell us that we can't do it? When should we not be able to do business with each other without getting someone else's permission, a third-party permission? And so this is a very individual empowering type of conversation that we were able to have, I was able to have with them during the presentation that showed them that Bitcoin is for the little guy. Bitcoin is grassroots. Bitcoin is for people that want to do business with each other and want as frictionless of a business transaction as possible. My goal during this part of the presentation was really to try to show people that you can control your money and you can control who you do business with, and you don't have to depend on the big banks to give you permission to do that. And I think that that worked really well from the feedback. People really appreciated that this wasn't a top-down type of system, but a very bottom-up grassroots monetary system. A phrase I used was email for money. And I know some of my diehard Bitcoin enthusiasts will tell me that Bitcoin is not email for money and all the various technical reasons why that is. And look, I understand that. But remember, we need to be able to speak in layman's terms at times. We can't start telling people, well, you see, the blockchain is a distributed, decentralized global ledger that is immutable and it stores, the, it's just going to blow people away. They're not ready for that. Email is something that everyone has used. Email is something that's easy for people to understand. Email replaced and is replacing physical mail. Everybody knows that you wouldn't go from the United States and drop a letter off in someone's mailbox in Italy, for instance. But you could just send them an email. It's cheap, it's fast, and can, it's convenient. Bitcoin, for this example, and it worked really well, was email for money. Another question that I got asked, and I think that we've all been asked this question, is who owns Bitcoin? Or who's the CEO of Bitcoin? Where, where is this company incorporated? Is it an American company? Is it a European company? A, a Chinese company? And what I found that worked really well was nobody owns Bitcoin just like nobody owns email. Email is a protocol. It's the SMTP protocol. Bitcoin is a protocol. It's a protocol for scarce digital goods. HTTP is a protocol. Nobody owns the HTTP protocol but there are companies and pieces of software that help you access the HTT protocol. Firefox, 
uh, Safari, Internet Explorer, Chrome. Nobody owns HTTP, but there are companies that help you get access. Just like no one owns email, but Google, you know, Gmail, Apple, Hotmail, they're all exchanges. They all allow you to use the email protocol. And that helped people understand that, oh, there's not some big evil business that's just another business trying to take advantage of us that owns Bitcoin, but it's, it's something that's not owned, but you can use it voluntarily for very, very cheap. And it's very easy to use the Bitcoin protocol. So it really helped depersonalize a lot of the fears that people had about who owned Bitcoin. Well, nobody owns Bitcoin. It's a protocol layer that lives on top of the internet. So I started talking about the moral argument and this was, I think a bit of a risky argument to make during a presentation because these were not libertarian people, but I thought it, it doesn't matter if you're libertarian or not. If you want betterment for society or you want to try to bring equality to people, if you want inclusion rather than exclusion in the world, Bitcoin is a perfect tool to help that. So I opened up, as I previously mentioned, about the bank bailouts on January the 3rd, 2009, and how that was the day that Bitcoin was made available to the public as an option. I also mentioned that inflation, a lot of these people are understand that inflation is becoming a problem in certain countries. Venezuela is the most obvious example and the example that I used. And the central bank of Venezuela is saying that their inflation rate is 180% per year right now, which is terrible, which is catastrophic, which means if, if you've got a hundred dollars in your bank account, the purchasing power of that hundred dollars after one year is going to be like $30, $35. And I'm just trying to do the math off the top of my head. So don't hold me to that. But I really hit home with how, how can you say that you care about the low and middle class when you're locking them into a monetary system that gets manipulated by the big banks and the governments, they print as much money as they want for whatever reason and give it out to whomever they want and suppress or, or manipulate interest rates. H how can someone who's in the low or middle class actually get ahead when they can't even trust the money that they're being forced to use? Bitcoin gives them an option. And I give them the example of, of my friend, Cindy Zimmerman in Panama. I believe that that may be uh, episode 41 where she's helping Venezuelans and Colombians buy Bitcoin with the dollars that they earn in Panama and send the Bitcoin home to try to help take care of their family. Even if they are able to send Venezuelan Bolivars back from Panama to Venezuela, which they're not going to be able to, they're going to be inflated at such a rate that it makes it almost worthless. They should just keep that in that value in us dollars. Let's just put aside the fact that they're not allowed to have bank accounts. It's extraordinarily difficult to open up a bank account for a Venezuelan citizen or resident. And it's almost impossible to open up a bank account in Bolivars. So Bitcoin is an option to really extend financial freedom and control to the lower class people, the people that this crowd says they really care about. And that connected really well. Now the unbanked have a chance. They have a chance to try to better themselves and to better their families. So remember that whenever we're talking about the importance of Bitcoin with people or cryptocurrencies or all these amazing things that we're doing right now, have some empathy, go back to when you didn't know anything about Bitcoin. Think about if you're going to talk to your mom or your cousin or somebody that has, has heard of it, but there's this negative connotation and it's up to you. It's your responsibility to break through that. It's your responsibility to remain calm and remain curious and to try to find out what is going to connect with this person with Bitcoin, 
because there's plenty of things that can connect. To a computer science crowd, I, I would have talked about the blockchain and, and how, you know, just the technical aspects and how blocks are created and, and how this solves the Byzantine general problem and, you know, got very technical. But that's not this crowd. You have to know your audience. If we really want Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to provide and offer the type of freedom that we know it can, then we have to help other people who are different minded than we are to see the benefits. It's not up to them to find the benefits. Yes, yeah, sure. If they want to use Bitcoin as a tool and it, they're more than welcome to find the benefits themselves, but we are the people that understand this. We are the, we are the experts. We're, we're the people that work in Bitcoin and love it for a long time. And we, all the reasons that we love it, we've got to figure out, well, this, the unbanked aspect is going to work with this person. The immutable ledger is going to work with this person. That's what I hope you get out of this podcast. So moving past Bitcoin, uh, just some observations that I had during the FinCon conference was that the government is definitely still hustling their, um, their bonds and their debt on anyone that will buy them. There were government officials there who had created some new pre-IRA type of investment program for young people, specifically high school kids and college kids where you get into these bonds and you know it's, it eventually rolls over into an IRA. But I asked him, I couldn't resist myself. I had to go up and ask him, you know, you're, you're, you're offering these bonds as the best investment. Historically, okay, they've been a great investment, a safe investment. You've gotten your money back. But I asked them, the Federal Reserve just the other day said again for like the, the billionth quarter in a row that it couldn't raise interest rates. If you're putting all these kids in these bonds and interest rates are at all-time historic lows, What's going to happen to the value of those bonds whenever interest rates start to rise? I, like many of you know, that an interest rate is inversely related to the value of a bond. Now, I'm not going to get too technical economically here, but when an interest rate on a bond rises, the value, the price of that bond drops. So if we're at all-time historic lows, the only place to go for interest rates is up then the only place to go for the price or the value of that bond is down. And I can tell you that these guys, these government official guys did not even know that a bond's price and its interest rate are inversely related. Um, I mention this because I think that students are very fertile ground for Bitcoin as an alternative currency and an alternative economy. And I think that they're going to really start doubting what the government is telling them. And it's almost like whenever you constantly get bad advice from someone, anything they tell you, you're just going to do the opposite. So if they're telling kids to buy these bonds, I don't think that's going to work. And I think that's very fertile ground for us to come in and mention that. Did you know there's an option? Did you know there's alternative uh, monies out there or alternative economies that you can opt into. Um, that leads me into student debt bubble or the student debt crisis. Wow. This was by far the largest and most popular topic in the entire conference. There were countless people there who were blogging about student debt, how I paid off $50,000 in student debt in 18 months, creating uh, books about student debt. A friend of mine has a book called Dear Debt. It's, it's like a, a letter to break up with debt. There were more people talking about how to get out of student debt and how to refinance student debt than I, I ever expected. Um, People that know me personally will know that I had been mentioning and talking about and writing about the student debt bubble since about 2010, 2009, when I heard Peter Schiff talking about this on his radio show, uh, Schiff Radio, back in the day. Well, it is alive and well, and unfortunately, these students are taking on all this debt without really knowing what to do. 
without really understanding that it's they, they actually have to pay all of this off and there is no bankruptcy and there's a subprime people are actually talking about i mean saying the the term subprime student loans and this is obvious to most of us that there's a a bubble a subprime bubble in student loans students that have almost no ability to pay these loans back are getting loans and it's really starting to blow up because and we're seeing that with every, all these people at the conference turning their attention to this topic if there wasn't as much pain in student debt it would not be attracting all of these writers and bloggers and podcasters and authors so student debt is an enormous problem one common solution to student debt from me networking and just talking to people was called side hustling. Um, it sounds pretty obvious, side hustling. You've got your normal job. You graduate. You've got your job. But you're looking to do something on the side to try to accelerate paying off this debt. And I met someone named Sandy who is going to come on the show and she did pay off $50,000 in student debt in 18 months by opening up an Amazon.com store where she sold various items. I mean, even, even items that you would think are silly, like uh, painted mugs, coffee mugs that she would sell. And it's a really good story. I won't ruin it now. But college students, especially once they've graduated and and see how much money they're not actually making from that degree are looking for digital companies to start to create some additional revenue, hopefully some passive income so that they can pay down these mountains of student debt. Another thing I noticed is that no one is talking about rising interest rates. No one. Well, I was with the government goons, but that's about it. Nobody's talking about rising interest rates. Everybody's still selling APR rates at all time lows or, you know, fixed rates at these levels are, are, I think a great deal if you can borrow money at such low interest rates, but nobody was talking about rising interest rates. Nobody was talking about the bond bubble. And that was concerning for me, uh, coming from the Austrian school of economics, it's very obvious to see that whenever we're financing our debt at historic lows and historic low interest rates and that interest rates start to rise, it's going to be like the student debt bubble on steroids. Uh, I'm pretty concerned that I was at a conference of content creators and approximately zero people outside of me were talking about what happens when interest rates start to rise. It just seems like this far off la la land type of scenario that why prepare for that? Why even talk about that? Interest rates are all time lows. They think inflation's at all time lows. There's nothing to worry about. Don't scream that the sky is falling. Boy, do they have interesting times ahead of them. So I'll start to wrap up here. I will say that I was a bit disappointed in the Bitcoin network. Not only is it more expensive now to send Bitcoin, but it's much slower. And I felt like a lot of the magic was gone in Bitcoin. Luckily, I was able to do some testing, some AB testing with a couple wallets before my presentation because I offered everyone uh, their free dollars worth of Bitcoin, their first dollars worth of Bitcoin, if they would download a wallet and I would send it to them because there's nothing like seeing a real Bitcoin transaction live than to hook somebody onto, oh, wow, this is really a technological breakthrough. This is so convenient and fast and it's just peer to peer us with our phones and these cool QR codes. But I ended up offering or recommending the mycelium wallet which i've interviewed uh, some people from their team on the show previously about how they're developing the wallet etc uh, whenever i scanned and tried to send bitcoin using other wallets they 
it seemed very slow. With the mycelium wallet seemed to take about the same time to confirm the transactions, but they had a little notice that came up at zero confirmations that said receiving $1 in Bitcoin within about five seconds. So it seemed very fast. It made it seem that the Bitcoin magic was still there, still alive, and it opened some people's eyes. I don't know about you, but I can remember my first Bitcoin transaction was with my buddy Gabe down in Panama, and it was a very magical experience for me. I was like, wow, you know, I was experienced in the banking world and it could take two weeks or more to get a wire passed through the banking system. And I couldn't believe how fast Bitcoin was. Speaking of how fast Bitcoin is, I found the following example to work really well with people. I said, and I got to credit my buddy, Eric Voorhees for giving me this example. It's faster to tape a $100 bill to an anvil and send it to China than it is to send that same $100 through the international banking system. And that that's true. That is absolutely true. And whenever I said that, people's eyes really lit up. And I said, I could send any amount of money to China in less than 30 minutes, and it would cost me about a nickel. Uh, maybe it would cost me a bit more now, but that really lit people's eyes up. Why would you send money at the speed of snail mail when you could send Bitcoin money at the speed of email? Okay, so this has been a bit of a rambling discussion here today. I hope you found it useful. I really want you to take away from this podcast my ideas on how I think that we can tailor our conversations and tailor our curiosity and the, and the facts and information that we share about Bitcoin. We need to tailor that to the people that we're speaking to. People learn all different ways. People have all different backgrounds. And we know that Bitcoin can help everyone. It's just a matter of understanding how and maybe a matter of time. But really dig down and stay humble that people are going to challenge you. I can't count the number of people that said, hey, well, you know, you got some drugs on you. I mean, isn't that what you do with Bitcoin? It's annoying. But who cares? I mean, you have the opportunity to find out what's important to them and really appeal to those aspects of them. If you want Bitcoin to succeed, you need to look in the mirror because it's up to you to get through to people who don't understand what Bitcoin is or maybe even have a negative connotation and help them understand what is Bitcoin and why should you care. Thanks again for tuning in. Check us out next week where I'll start having my typical interview-based podcast I've got a lot of exciting podcasts coming up with some people that I met at FinCon and how they side hustle and get out of debt. I know a lot of my audience is fairly young in, in mid twenties to mid thirties, and you're probably still paying off debt. I think you're going to learn a lot of lessons from these people about side hustling. Maybe you can start your own online Amazon store and get out of debt quicker. I'm also planning uh, an interview with my buddy Jason King to get an update of Unsung, which is his Uber-like app, but for food to feed the hungry. It's a beautiful story and a beautiful company. He's doing such a great job about how the free market and voluntary action can help solve our hunger problem in the U.S. and worldwide, but he concentrates in the U.S. I've also got some ideas. I want to get your feedback about building an e-commerce site, CryptoShirts.io. This was a, just a project that I wanted to do with my virtual assistant, Dexter, to see what it would take to get an e-commerce site up. And I want to help you learn what, what I struggled with, how I succeeded in building an e-commerce site, and just you know how long it took, what, what, I, what I bumped into, who I'm using for hosting, what plugins I'm using, et cetera, to try to get up and started. Uh, so if you're if that's something that you're interested in, if you want to learn how to quickly build an e-commerce site, and I mean quickly, just like a couple weeks to build and get up an e-commerce site as experience, then you know send me an email at info at libertyentrepreneurs.com or tweet at me at Liberty E Podcast. Another idea that I've had that I'd like to share with you is um, maybe I could put together a series or maybe a tutorial or a, a worksheet or something or an e-bus, a very short e-brochure about hiring, training, 
and working with and the benefits of virtual staff. You know, I've been working with Dexter for a couple months at Liberty Entrepreneurs, but at my at my day job, if you will, I've been working with people from all over the world that I've never met uh, from very different cultures that I've successfully built business with. And I think as digital entrepreneurs, like either you are, or if you're listening to this show, you want to become having a virtual assistant is paramount to your success. So that's, that's another idea that I've had that I could share with you. If you would prefer to learn about that, you know, again, email me info at liberty entrepreneurs.com tweet at me, Liberty E podcast, come on Facebook page, facebook.com slash Liberty entrepreneurs. You know, let me know what you want to hear and I'll try to put it together. I really want to become a resource for you to be a successful digital entrepreneur and have the ability to live that digital nomadic lifestyle where if you want to get up and visit Greece or Tokyo or you want to go to Taiwan and check it out or the Philippines or maybe you just want to go down to Panama for a month or two or three, then you have the ability and the cash flow and the flexible lifestyle that will afford that to you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Come back next week. And until then, keep building freedom. Peace.